never been a time in a world like this for you to become something. People like us, we have paved the way for the new generation to go and be inspired and go and do something and there's no excuses then. Don't give up on your dreams because this thing is real, like, that's it. Today I'm having a chat with someone who, quite frankly, is a production powerhouse, Nguyen's very own, without further ado, Still Bangles, the great. Let's, let's get into it. Talk to me, talk to me about the beginning. Well, I'm Still Bangles. Uh, I grew up in Forest Gate, Newham. Um, I grew up in an Indian household uh, to Sikh parents, Punjabi parents, and my mum's a classical music teacher and my dad's a poet, so I was always surrounded by like books and instruments around the house. And we didn't have much growing up, so whatever our parents' interests were, heavily influenced by Bollywood, Punjabi music. But I was fortunate enough to grow up in um, a, a more diverse, ethnically diverse area, more so to the Green Street side. The Green Street side is more like Asian people. That, but I grew up more on the Forest Gate Youth Club side. So my next door neighbors were Jamaican. One of them being DWE, one of the most iconic grime MCs of all time. I grew up with one of my Turkish friends, uh, Ghanaian friends, Nigerian friends. So I was surrounded by so much diversity. And as I was growing up and everything I was absorbing in Forest Gate was like conditioning me like when it came to sound. How old were you around the time I, that I was about DWE nine, was on his rise? I was like nine, ten, and I used to see Double. He was in um, Nasty Crew and Deja Vu FM. And, Met Dizzy Rascal through him. I bet I was that was like, one of your claims to fame when you was at school, innit? I met Dizzy. Yeah, I met Dizzy, like, it's <laughs> crazy, like. And he was, like, not far off from me. He was, like, seven years older than me, and he dropped Boy in the Corner and all that. It was crazy, but um, every sound I was hearing was conditioning me to become this monstrous producer. At the same time, I have to pay homage to D-Double, because if it wasn't for him handing me vinyls or my older brother's DJing, I wouldn't have developed the ear to understand loads of diverse sounds, whether it was reggae or like African influenced music from like Ghana, from Sadiq's house or Mickey playing Westlife like, or my mum playing Lata Mangeshka. Like, I was always being conditioned in this way. Yeah. So talk to me about your first experience with you feeling like you were going to approach a musician to work with them um, as, as a, a producer. It was actually D-Double. So um, I was making beats for time in the ends. What were you making them on? I was making them on FL Studio. So like my music teacher, Miss Connell, she's actually Scottish. She used to have a picture of Bob Marley and, uh, on the wall. And I used to think, why is her eyes so glazed? But at young times, I never used to clock. <laughs> but I was like, OK, now I get it. I went and linked to her. Like a few years back, I gave something back to the children in a new school. But at year nine, I'd done GCSE, my GCSE in year nine for music. And I A-starred it. So when I came at year 10, I was in the papers, kid, musician, genius, everywhere, new and recorder, wow, A-star music, wow, two years early, like, it's facts, like, you can go and check this, like, I A-starred my music no, two I believe years you, early. I don't think you're lying. It's crazy. So then, boom, I thought I was the man. And then in year 10, I'd done my um, music tech course, which you would do in college, and I banged that out in one year. So when I got to year 11, I was bare gas, but then I was working on the FL studio, so Fruity Loops was was a program that you could crack. Everyone knows this, I'm not lying. Like Most producers know they download the copy, the, the, crack the software, because we can't afford it where we come from, it's too expensive, so. So that's where I was going next. Um, mm. Even the software that you did have, or the access to computers and stuff, like, mm -hmm. how did you get your first piece of equipment that was gonna help it's to, to lead the way? all through my brothers, man. All through my older brothers, the decks that I had were belt drives. If you're a real DJ, you know about belt drives. They're not direct drives, there's two type of vinyl decks. Directors, you let the vinyl go, boom, it goes quick. Belts is you got to push the tune to get into the mix. So I got the decks through that, and then my brother started growing up doing that own thing, got jobs, so they had the PC. It was like a tiny PC world. I think it was back in the day, it was tiny XPC world. See how you got curries in PC world today? Back then it was tiny PC world. So we had this tiny computer, and then I just downloaded Fruit Loops and just started making beats. But I always used to play the keys. I used to play the harmonium, which my mum taught me, which is an organic Indian instrument. So you, you, it's a wind instrument, so you blow it, like you press it with one hand and you play the melody with the other. Wow. So it's mad, so you're just like that. So that's where I learned a lot of melody from. 
But yeah, and when I went into production, it was FL Studio, bought a MIDI keyboard, started slapping out a beat, um, got one of my friends to tell Double I produce. I remember he come to my yard, played him a tune and we made colours. And that was a big yeah, momentous track for, for, for D Double at that yeah, time. That was massive, massive. Louis White made the original, but then I made the second version. So yeah, it was crazy. How were you convincing your parents, your Sikh parents, mm. that what you was doing was conducive to working hard and, yeah, I, I'm not going to go get a job, normal yeah. job, because I'm focusing on this? It wasn't easy, but where my mum's a musician and, she, and like sometimes you see my older brothers and, and my parents, because they had to go and sacrifice their hobbies or what they really wanted to flourish in life with, it influenced me. I was like, nah, I'm not letting my mum work when she's a dope musician or like my brother's a bad boy DJ. I'm going to be a sick DJ. So like, as a, the youngest one in the family, I started seeing everyone just not pursue their dreams. So I was like, it was more of like, don't tell me what to do because you wanted to be a musician at a time and I'm not going to, this family's going to, someone's going to do this music. Like, we were very passionate, creative people, like, mad. I, I love that because I see so many people, especially as you get older, it's like the dream starts to become something that's seen as unrealistic. So people mm -hmm. start to veer away from that in trade of more conventional careers because mm -hmm. that's what is supposed to be it's done. It's not their fault though. They had to put food on the table. Exactly. And, and you know, that touched me. I was always an artistic person. I take things to heart. Like the most simplest things I'd sit there and think about for hours where someone could just deal with it and brush it off. I'm like, nah, I'm not stopping this music thing. Like I have to do it, I have to do it. I feel that and it's, it's important to be able to see that those struggles that people mm. went through in sacrifice of what is now still mm. bangles. If, mm. if that struggle hadn't come, maybe might, we would never have seen this. Yeah. Talk to me about how you feel that discomfort played a role in your success. Sometimes people feel like you need to go to a specific institution to, do, to study um, in did. order to be successful. But, so, but for some, it is also a culmination of your personal experiences. I think when you look at art and you look at some of the most creative industries and you look at the stories of some of the most successful people in any artistic industry, whether it's film, poetry, fashion, music, whatever it be, it doesn't really come from an academic background. It comes from more of a drive of like passion and like I have a dream and I'm going to do this. Like I tried the academic route. Like I told my dad, I said, no, there's an um, um, institute called um, SAE in Caledonian Road, North London. And I said to him, dad, if you put me in this school, pay the six thousand pound thing, I promise you, I'll, I'll never be a bad boy ever again. I was messing about, smoking weed, doing this stupid stuff. Three months into the course, I ended up in jail. And then I was just like, fuck, like, this is fucked up. <laughs> now he's looking at me like, you definitely fucked up. So I'm like, I was like, shit, my music career. I'm like, ah! But it, yeah, so it's, just, it's part of that story. Like, it's part of my journey being in, in prison because I met so many dope musicians. And when I came out of prison, they were the hottest things on the street. And it weren't grime, it was rap emerging from South London. South London is the real reason why rap music is, and I'm from East, but I can admit fully that like, South London, is the reason why rap music is so popular today and it's flourishing to where it is. You had that PDC, you had SMS Ill Mill, you had Blade Brown. Yeah, I was making beats with Colors Miyagi and in my cell. It was mad on <laughs> social, it was crazy. But I just knew, like, even though I was in prison and wherever I was, I just knew that this thing's about to go. Like, I just knew it. It's like some sixth sense. Like, I just knew, like, whatever's happening in America is going to happen in England. Like, I just knew it. So talk me through uh, the, what happened to land you in prison and then your experience mm. in prison. So, um, I had a dispute with someone, me and my friend. We both had firearms and we just wanted to just... Where did you get them from? I don't want to know the actual that's all location. Done that was like years ago. So that was like 16, 17 when that happened. So I was a young boy. 16, 17. Yeah, I was making a lot of dough them days as well. She so was I, kind of, you was in your own new um, movie, madness, like in your head. Madness, I had 110 grand SL55 AMG at 17. No one at my age was doing that. I was having 50 grand a week. I was doing a madness. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was doing, everyone, will, all the money in the ends will vouch. If you see my documentary, you'll see it. So in a way, it sounds like that, that slowdown process helped you. Because mm -hmm. it could have been, I mean, how long would you Yeah, because I would have done some for? mad shit if I didn't get arrested at that time for pulling out a strap on someone that disrespected me. I could have done something else and I wouldn't even be here talking to you. Exactly. I could be doing a life sentence, so. But the good thing is, is that, that, that that's what it's supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. So for once in it's... It's called reform, that's what you want, right? Yeah, for, so. for once, prison actually served to reform mm -hmm. the, 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 the prisoner. So 
your first day there, I'm sure, was not a comfortable It didn't experience. even feel real. I, I, it didn't register in my head what had happened. From the moment I got arrested on Streatham High Street with the police, for armed police, to the moment I was in High Down, to the moment I was in the wing, I remember I ended up getting out of the police station, going to court, not getting bail, and going straight to the wing, and I remember that. It just didn't feel real. It's only when I got sentenced, like seven months later, that I got six years, six and a half. And was that a scary experience? I was just a kid. But the, I feel like being a kid is like the worst time, like even going to a new school, a new job, like a, 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 it's definitely a new prison, just knowing that actually I can't go home, I can't mm. not come back tomorrow if I don't like it. It could have been a real it, fucked it, up it, situation. It, it was mad, but I think when you get a long sentence, um, you know, they, you kind of end up with people that are doing similar sentences to you and they all just want to get, get over it. It's not, it's not too gassed, do you know what I'm saying? Okay, so you've, you've met, you're, you're in there, You've met up with these people. Did you know any of them prior? No, no. So this is like a new Brand set new, of people. Everyone's together. freestyling on um, um, social or like, um, you know, when you walk around the yard, the, the exercise yard. Some man was on 23 hour bang up, so the only thing you had was the exercise yard. Some man are playing cards, some man are freestyling. I was like, yeah, I make beats before I come in. I was a producer. And then, so anyway, I got a keyboard in, um, whilst I was inside and I just started making bare tunes. And I kept in touch with the rappers came out and MySpace was popping. So I just came back, locked my door, bang. First mixtape landed, fixed on um, Young Meth, Fix and Meth. Second mixtape, Woolly Road, fixed on um, bang. I was in the game, met Cashtastic, met Krypton Conan, bang, built that studio, boom, boom, built my name there. And it just started working. But man was broke, like I was borrowing bare money off my brethren. So, but I couldn't get a job, I couldn't hustle, my whole thing was fucked. And how did that feel? Because obviously going from someone who was super advanced cash-wise mm -hmm. as a young mm -hmm. one to actually someone who's having to borrow money from everyone. I just applied the same rules that you have when you're incarcerated. You got canteen, you only had 20 pound a week. So man survived on, so man, the instincts kicked in. Man, don't, you can't leave a room. So I didn't leave the studio. I slept on the floor, woke up, made beats, made contacts. Twitter started popping them days. Tweeting everyone, yo, I got beats. So transferable skills actually yeah, came it. and followed you, yeah, and actually it was really a blessing. That's why I say it's a blessing because the, the, my passion towards it was even more like it's similar in in a, in a lot of ethnic cultures. The son goes to prison, the mum gets it from all the aunties, and they're going to show uh, weddings and all of this stuff, and they're like, your son's in prison, they're taking a piss, like you know the indirect ones, like, yeah. oh, your son's a failure, like my son's this guy, boom, boom, boom. So I like even more. I just wanted more. I just had to prove it even more. Like, and what were you looking towards? So. You're going through this, and mm. like I said, the, the UK scene wasn't popping in a mm. way that fi for finances. No. So how was you convincing yourself that I this was going to be okay? I was part of the growth process. I understood we came from pirate radio. Our lingo came from migrated Jamaicans into this country, and and they and you know what I'm saying the growth of African culture once once when it was um, like frowned upon by other cultures. Now it's the most popular culture, like Asian people influencing, like I just knew when I was looking at America, because I was studying a lot of stuff, I knew that the, the rise of ethnic cultures in America and the music and the food and just the fact, everything that came with it, there was a prime example for me to lead from. And I knew because we speak English and this is a, like, if this was a different speaking country, like in language wise, then I would have kind of looked at it different, but I knew it was going to be Canada and then UK next, because I just knew if you speak English and you're making music and you're doing fashion, it's just going to happen. So I was just using the blueprint from Americans. Your first moment where you were like, OK, I'm actually going to get paid from this. Like, not just in my head, I'm actually getting paid. Someone was offering me a check. What, what was that? That was a mixtape I did with Cash Tastic. It was called A Little Bit of Cash. And I got like, I think, like seven bills it's in advance. I was happy. Even though my rent was seven bills a month for the studio, sometimes the bailiff would turn up, it was nuts. And then you but, yeah. were working with Cash and then Cash got deported. Yeah, yeah, that was a sad which time. Which must have been a real... Mad time. Like, man. up and then... Mm -hmm. It's just another struggle, man. It's just another fight. And then again, depression kicks in. You kind of feel like you don't want to do things. and you're Just trying to figure it out. But as you're going through your thing, the scene's still growing. The scene don't stop. It's not waiting, Boom, I meet Mo Stack. Missed, bow, I'm back again. Chief, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And those moments, so most I can miss, obviously much like in, in a very contemporary mm -hmm. moment and you make the banger. Mm -hmm. And then what? I just knew, but when I first heard Mist, like one of my brethren, he always used to come down from Leicester, his name's Maru. 
He's a rapper himself. He's hard. He's, I usually used to show me certain rappers. And, you know, that London mentality. If you're not from London, we're not rating. I, I couldn't really, I had to get out of that. Because I remember a lot of men from London were like, them man ain't saying nothing outside of London. You know that kind of? Yeah. But then when he played me Miss and I heard him say, sick mate, Carlos back, get robbed, you ain't getting your donuts. I was like, this guy's speaking my language. <laughs> I said, boy, I've been conditioned to this point to do this record with this man. Like, I know I, can, I am the right guy to bring these communities together. Do you know what I'm saying? So I messaged him on the gram and then, yeah, I just went and linked him, bring him back to London and Carlos back with a bang, bang. Done. Hey, so when you when you was messaging him, were you worried that he weren't going to respond, or did you? No, no, I'm just always a positive, spiritual human being. I, I, I do get that vibe for you. This, yeah. this, the spiritual sense. You definitely have an energy of, mm -hmm. of, of forthcomingness and open, very mm -hmm. open book. Mm -hmm. When you're buried alive, that's what I call prison, buried alive, and you're non-existence in the outside world. When you enter it, you know your powers. Oh, that's made my pause raise a little bit. <laughs> I like that. It was really yeah. well put. Oh, bit yeah. poetic out here. All right, bang goes. Hundred percent. Yeah, Shakespeare ain't got nothing on you. Nah, All right. Got <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying. But a lot of people talk about manifesting what you want, law of attraction. But you really got to put the work in. You can't just sit there. I'm not going to sit here. It ain't that magical that I'm like, yes, I want a Lamborghini today. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to be like, it just. God, please, every day. If I sat here for 12 hours a day, it's not going to come outside, is it? Yeah. You have so, to put the work in. How did you start to decide, actually, I need to get paid for this? And, and I know I'm really stressing the money, mm -hmm. but just because a lot of people are in the stage where they're mm -hmm. actually having to convince their parents, mm -hmm. listen, mm -hmm. what I'm doing is going to change all of our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really want to convey that message and how, how you start to price. I think it just started happening from... But prior to um, meeting Mist, I wasn't really getting paid. So it was more of like my savings or the loans I took from AJ or V or my brother Sav, like a lot of people gave me money because I was so passionate, I could convince them like, trust me, bro, I'm going to do this. Give me that five back. <laughs> Even they would stress me out, bro, it's taking a bit, two, two years now, like, what's going on? Do you know what I'm saying? But when I made Carlos back, the interest started coming. But as an artist, I've never been fascinated by money. It's more about the art. That's all I care about. The money comes. That's what someone told me a long time ago. Just do what you're doing. The money comes in abundance. You started getting paid. You started doing really well. Um, mm. What do you What do you do with your money? What do I do with my money? Yeah. Um, retired my mum. I got V, who's uh, V and AJ, who are my fund managers at Lax Capital. We're based down in uh, the Cheese Greater Building in London. They do their thing, property. So you're investing? Yeah, of course. I'm asking because I don't want to make any assumptions. Mm -hmm. I want everyone to, to, mm -hmm. to know on a plate exactly mm -hmm. what it is that you're doing. And I yeah, want to know. And I'm investing back in my album. Um, I'm, I'm independent now. Very important. And I invested back into my documentary, booking mad studios, trying to find new experiences, new inspirations. Just putting money back into Steel Bangles, the brand as well. Not just like outer investments because... I think that's important. Yeah, yeah like uh, some people, like I think they forget that they need to put money back into themselves. So it's my job to be creative, make bangers. Who's the next rap artist coming through? How are we going to advance this label, Gifted Records, Catalyst Records? How are we going to... It's not my job to know what share has gone up. And I ain't going to get twisted in that. And I see man get money from this music thing and lose their minds. And I'm just like, bro, stick to the art. Think about your next video. Put money into your thing. I think that's amazing. I've, sadly, not enough people have people on deck like that that mm -hmm. can actually help them to control their capital. So they are kind of forced to do too too much. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I think sometimes it can take you away from the art. You just want to be able to be the artist. Yeah. You want to know those decisions are being made, but they're also being made by people that you trust and you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's still nice to get rich from your art. Let's not put that aside. Oh, it's, it's happening, but <laughs> it, you can't let it get to your head, though. No, of course, and you always have to be humble and remember where you've come from and mm -hmm. the fact that this art form mm -hmm. took you out of a, exactly. a, a life that was Yeah, and don't act like conducive. you're better than everyone. So what are you working on at the moment, Bangles? I've got my album coming out, my debut album. Very excited about that. Amazing. Great features on there. Any we can talk about? Any exclusives? Just loads. I just dropped Tion Wayne, Morrison, Blammer, Clean Bandit. Steph London, Unknown T and Wes Nelson on one song. You got Fredo on the album. You got like, literally everyone, everyone. How did it feel working with gigs? Like gigs is like- That's the iconic moment for me. 
yeah, it's a bit magical because he's yeah. he's a he's a funny character, our gigs. Yeah. Yeah? yeah, he's a very funny character, and he don't like to work with everyone. No, nah. and when he does, it's because he really fills a project. So yeah, I mean, when I started out in two thousand and eight, two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. Pain is the essence come out on dubs and gigs as a mixtape. Mm. And I was like, Rah, this guy's gone. I was trying, as a producer, I remember like gigs, gig had, gigs is the only person whose buzz I've seen hypnotize the whole country. Do you think it's his voice? Obviously, it was just it's hypnotizing. Him. It was just like, but that voice, when an it comes alchemist out. has just come like, choo, choo, bow. I've never <laughs> seen a buzz like gigs is. And this is before social media. Like, when I'm talking about them Samsung phones with the little speakers and everyone's playing each gig songs continuously, I've never seen a, a buzz walk, in the it UK. Was a Sony, it was a Walkman phone, no? They had that, that one that too, one. that one too. The Samsung, the Walkman. Yeah, he had, he had, he had a couple good summers, His man. Buzz blazing was out people's It was like gold. And then skin, he dropped talking the hardest, and from there it was done. Hey. That's when I knew I was like, bow. So, as a producer coming up, I, I always wanted to work with gigs. And when I finally got to work with him, even the record we created, the studio session, when you see it, it's just iconic. It's like two guys meeting from the birth of UK rap. Like, and then what's to come? Because we've been doing a little bit of and piano um, raving. Any, anything in that vibe? Yeah, I've been in? speaking with Black Coffee. So we've got something running in there. I've got India now. So I went to India. I've got the biggest Indian artist, Sidhu Muswala, which I've done 47 with Steph and Mist. If you could give me a sentence to describe exactly who Still Bangles is, what would it be? Love that. As long as you stay pure and show love and never give up, you'll always win. That's it. I like that. Simple. Thank you. Cool. Let's cheers to that a little toast, young toast. Cheers. So you never know, I might be the next Jimmy Iovine or Dre or Puff Daddy. That's what I'm looking at. Hey.